RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave for a hardware review. It's been a while since we had one, so we need to correct that. And no, it's not about the Raspberry Pi 4, the ever popular Raspberry Pi and the latest in the evolution of the Raspberry Pi products. Great as though it is, um, I've got an alternative here for you, which I think you might enjoy. Now it's been around for a while, but we're a retro channel. What's the rush to review the latest and greatest things? I like to actually use them first rather than rushing out a review. So that's what I've been doing. And uh, well, let's take a look at what we've got on the desk here and uh, show you what it's capable of. And we can decide if it's a viable alternative for your retro gaming and retro computing needs. Let's take a look. So a selection of things on the desk here, but we'll start with the main unit. And this can be used as a standalone device. All of the rest complements it. And this is the DE10 Nano. Now both the Pi and the DE10 have ARM CPUs as part of their system on a chip design. The new Raspberry Pi 4 is running an ARM CPU with four Cortex-A72 cores on board, but our DE10 has less than half that, two Cortex-A9 cores running at 800 megahertz. Based on those specs, you might be quick to write off the DE10 as an underpowered Pi, but it's not really about traditional specs here. This is about something different. It's all about this chip here. This is the Altera Cyclone 5 system on a chip, and it is where that dual core ARM CPU resides. But also in here is an FPGA or field programmable gate array with a bridge between the two sides. Here's a diagram to show you what I mean. And on this diagram, the ARM CPU is labeled as an HPS or hard processor system because that's what it is. It's a hardwired fixed circuit waiting to perform calculations in exactly the way that the ARM CPU is specified to do so. The FPGA side on the left, however, is the opposite, something softer if you like. Yes, it's physical, it's hardware. Look, I'm prodding it, it's right there. But it's not fixed like the hard processor system. Living in here are 110,000 logic elements which can be organized, programmed, molded like putty to the shape or shapes that you want and partitioned into many simple or complex units, mimicking real hardwired circuits at a hardware level and not, as we find on our other platforms, at the software level in our software emulators. The FPGA then can be configured to mimic all of the chips that you want, for example, the 68000 CPU in the Amiga 500, as well as its custom chips, Gary, Paula, Denise, and they can then all run in parallel with precise timing, just like the original computer. Software emulation, in contrast, is beholden to the sequential nature of execution in a traditional CPU although that might be happening so fast with the help of additional cores that the difference may not be discernible to you at face value. But believe me, this is operating in a very different way to our Raspberry Pi or emulators on our desktop computers. That being said, FPGA is certainly not a magic bullet, in much the same way as giving a bad artist some paint, giving a bad coder the development tools for this is not going to result in something that's going to blow your mind. It's not going to result in a coding work of art. However, you may have guessed by the buzz that surrounds FPGA systems, and there are quite a few of them coming out now, such as the Super NT, uh, Super Nintendo console unit that you can buy, which is FPGA based, and in fact has the same Cyclone chip at the heart of it. There is an excellent community that's rallied around this and created some excellent systems, or cores as they're known, on which to run on this computing chameleon. One such group of enthusiasts is the Mr. Project, whose name adorns some of the hardware we're looking at here today. Intel describes the Cyclone 5 chip on our DE10 as being perfect for automotive or military purposes. Intel is wrong. This is for gaming. So what this setup gives us is consoles, computers and arcade FPGA cores and all the favourites are here from the Super Nintendo to the PC Engine, Sega Mega Drive or Genesis to the Atari 2600. When it comes to the arcades, arcades like Bomb Jack, each arcade is its own core and while the list is growing it's nothing like the list of arcades that you'd find in say the MAME emulator. Each is a core in isolation and there is a good reason for that. Software emulators like MAME, 
stimulated an explosion in game ROM preservation, which was great, those games will never be lost now. And FPGA, I hope, will now repeat that, but with the preservation of the logic of the classic machines. It's not just about making the game run, it's about perfect preservation of both game and now of the logic behind it all. On the computer side, I was pleased to see the Commodore Amiga is present, and that's been rolled over from an old project called the Mini MiG, which dates back to a concept in 2005, so that's one of the more mature cores here, and I was equally pleased to find the Apple Mac Plus core to play with. That's a system I didn't get to use much back in the day, so that will be an interesting one to play with. And a really nice surprise, the Acorn Archimedes. Archimedes were a powerful range of risk-based computers, often found in British classrooms, and they deserve a lot more praise and attention than they get. Anyway, consider this little montage a taster of what's to come. We'll dive into the cores more shortly, but first I'll show you quickly the kit that you need to run all of this. So this setup is built around the DE10 Nano by Terasic, and I must say a big thank you to Johnny Mullen who sent this one in, so thank you Johnny, I'm really very appreciative for it. On its own, the DE10 is really designed as something of an educational tool to get familiar with FPGA development, and it's endorsed by Intel. On board we'll find a gigabit ethernet port, HDMI video output and lots of GPIO or general purpose input output pins to pair it up with add-on devices. And it can run a few of our cores as a standalone device, but to really turn this into a retro gaming machine, we need a few extras. And that's where the retro shop steps in. They've conveniently put together a bundle. That's where mines all come from and they call it the Mr. Razer XL Edition bundle. You can find a link to the bundle in the video description. In the pack we get an SD RAM module which is mandatory for the majority of cores and it slots right onto the GPIO socket like so. With that in place you can go ahead and start using it but some of the more complex cores benefit from a further expansion again. And that expansion is the Mr. I.O. board that sits on top of the Nano and screws into place. What this brings to the party is an analog and digital audio output from the 3.5mm jack and I love this it's an analog video output from which you can get a 15kHz output meaning you can plug it into things like an original arcade monitor and it can then become the heart of your arcade cabinet. On storage duty is a micro SD card slot, there's one on the Nano and also one on the Mr. board so you'll never be short of storage options. And we've got three status LEDs as well as three push buttons They can be used to bring up system menus, reset the running core, take us back to the main menu, that sort of thing. To top it off we have an uprated Noctura branded fan and then there's a heatsink which I've added to keep it all cool. The underlying OS is Linux, and I've had no problems with all the USB joysticks, keyboards, mice that I've plugged into it. it, it just works fine. There is one small annoyance though, and that's that you'll need a USB hub. This can be in the form of another hat that stacks up on the Nano, or just a hub with a USB mini connector, which is what I've got here. What looks like a USB 3 port on the Mister is actually a serial I.O. port, and that's a little deceptive. We're all ready to go. The total cost of this setup is £70 for the Razer XL bundle, that's the fan, the Mr. I.O. board and the RAM module and that's all from the Retro Shop. The link is in the description if you're looking to buy that bundle. And then of course you've got the D10 Nano board which is around £100 but there is a discount, an educational discount if you're a student. So £170, around $215 US dollars or €190 Euros for all of this lifts us out of the Raspberry Pi territory price-wise plus you need the USB hub, peripherals, and perhaps a case if you want a case to put it all into. So we'll fire it up. Over here we have the HDMI output. Over here, the analog VGA output into our CRT. And if we plug it in, you'll see how quickly it boots from that micro SD card into our menu. It's really very quick to get up and running. There we go, there's the main menu and we can very quickly get into our cores. We've got a picture over here, but we've got nothing on the CRT because this is not a multi-sync monitor. It doesn't support the 15 kilohertz, which it detects uh, is in the signal that it's receiving. That's an easy fix though for our main menu. General settings can be found in the mister.ini file where we can force the scan doubler like so. And you'll notice there's lots of other useful analog video and audio options here, but these settings won't necessarily filter down into the cores, so you'll have to take each one on its own merit. If you're using HDMI though, you won't have any issues. HDMI is perfect for compatibility and for ease of use. Analog output is really for the authentic experience on a CRT, and I love that it's included because pairing it up with a CRT works really nicely and it looks fantastic. But if you just want to plug in and play, then HDMI is perfect. 
Setting up the memory card is no more taxing than setting up a Raspberry Pi. There's a setup tool to help you prep the card and then you can drag your cores and ROMs onto the board. When we switch it on, the underlying OS is Linux and it's an extremely fast booting distribution. You're very, very quickly into the main menu where the very first thing you should really do is plug in a network cable and run the update script that will pull down all the latest versions of the cores that you have and then you're ready to play. Now, how do we look at the cores? It would take all day to drill down into each and every core, so I think I'll give you some highlights and observations with a bit more emphasis on the cores that interest me. Here's our main menu, and if we have a quick look in arcades, you can see all of the arcade cores in alphabetical order. These are all early to mid 1980s arcades, and this isn't really where the Mr. excels in terms of choice right now, but what is here works very well, and I'd expect this list to grow a lot more over time. You could very easily drop this into a real Robotron or Pac-Man cabinet, and nobody would know the difference. And with lag times on the Mr. now down to under one single frame, you really can't be blaming shoddy emulation for your poor reaction times. As I play Robotron, you can see that the menu can be popped up and displayed at any time with the core options, and the ability to redefine controls, as I'm doing here. It would be nice to see more complex arcade games on here to see how it handles them, such as the Neo Geo. And the Neo Geo core is in development, but it's still very much a work in progress, so hopefully that will see the light of day soon. So as an arcade machine, our FPGA setup has the potential to offer us a very accurate recreation of those original boards, with video output indistinguishable from the original. But there is a lot more to come. Can we expect to see complex 3D arcade games on this? Well, yes and no. The Cyclone 5 chip is available with 25, 49, 110, 301,000 and more logic elements, so it can be scaled up to cater for the complexity of a 3D GPU, for example. But the clock speeds we're capable of are under 100 megahertz with FPGAs in this price range. Atari Jaguar, Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 cores are in development, and I'd expect those to be the upper limit for this setup, so perhaps Virtua Fighter, Virtua Racing or arcades of that ilk will make an appearance. I'm excited to see what develops. On the 2D front, what is in development is the CPS arcade system, which will bring us games like Final Fight and Street Fighter 2, so that will be a nice addition. But hey, it plays Robotron. I mean, that's the only arcade game I need. <laughs> On the console cores, we do of course have to look at the most popular, like the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis, and you won't be disappointed one bit by the Mega Drive core, it runs smooth and fast. Too fast for my PAL upbringing as we see Sonic here in NTSC mode, and it's really everything you'd expect and want. Everything in fact that you'd want from a standalone Mega Drive FPGA system, and that's exactly what the recently released analog Mega SG console is, which has the same Cyclone 5 chip, albeit with less than half the logic elements in it, and that's priced at $189.99 on their website. It's a great device, but I know I'd rather have the flexibility of a setup like this, which can handle multiple systems for that price personally. It's not completely flawless yet, some people do report minor audio issues. Audio for some reason a, a constant bane to emulation development, and I did think I'd come across an example when I fired up Mega Swiv, but no, it really does have that crunchy sounding audio in the real thing. just a game with bad sound effects in this instance. So my Mega Drive experience is a good one made all the better through the use of a USB to DB9 adapter and an original Sega pad which needed no additional configuration. And of course a CRT monitor. Ah, Mega Drive bliss. The same could also be said for the Super Nintendo, another great core. So you effectively have both the Mega SG and the Super NT FBGA based standalone consoles in one with this setup. It looks, sounds and plays perfectly, right down to the slowdown seen when this large dragon type enemy flies around the screen, and that's faithful to the original system. Some cores do offer overclocking and other speed options like more sprites per line, but these aren't universal settings, they are once again on a core by core basis, and there are no such options on the Super Nintendo or the Mega Drive.
compatibility is great, Mode 7 games didn't pose a problem for games like Pilot Wings or F Zero, so it's a big thumbs up on the Super Nintendo from me. The PC Engine is also a blast, so you can cross the PC Engine Mini off your shopping list too. The only issue I found with this was, once again, very occasional audio issues where it would quietly hold the last musical note played on some games. It wasn't a deal breaker, just one of those tiny things that makes your ears prick up and momentarily breaks the effect that this isn't real hardware. To see if this will be fixed and to set your expectation as to where the cores will continue to be developed, it's worth checking the latest release notes on the cores to see what's going on. The PC Engine, or Turbo Graphics Core now for example, runs all games except for Davis Cup Tennis, which is a shame as it's Wimbledon right now, and Andre Panzer Kickboxing, so there's still a little bit of work to do on it, and it does support the multi-tap for up to 5 joysticks. A link to all the core information is in the video description, so do have a check and you can find out if you too can play games like Toilet Kids faithfully. I'm not going to go through all the console cores, but it handles the 8 and 16-bit consoles with relative ease, and any small quirks are being actively ironed out, so you're in for a good time. Just like the arcade cores, I don't expect to see our FPGA simulating, say, the Sega Dreamcast with its 100MHz Power VR2 rendering engine, but it will be nice to see the PlayStation 1 appear, the core of which was originally written by a team at Carnegie Mellon University, which is now being fine-tuned by the community, so hopefully that will make an appearance soon. 8 and 16-bit console nirvana is yours then, you can even play some Game Boy Color if that takes your fancy. And as fun as all of this is, for me, it's really the personal computer cores that interest me, so let's take a look at those just as soon as I've finished beating up Hagrid here. Tell me I'm a wizard, Hagrid. So these are the computer cores, and currently on the list we have the Altair 8800, Amstrad CPC, 486 PC, Apogee, which we all know is a Soviet homemade 8-bit computer designed by amateur radio enthusiasts in 1986, you knew that right, the Apple II, Mattel Aquarius, Acorn Archimedes, which makes me very happy, we'll have a look at that one, the Atari 800, BBC Micro, BK0011M, which is a PDP-11 compatible Soviet home computer. Something tells me FPGA coding is popular in former Soviet parts of the world. And of course we've got the Commodore 16 and 64, the Tandy Coco 3, Jupiter Ace for coders who love the fourth language, and the list goes on and on. Minimig is the Commodore Amiga that we'll definitely get a look at, and there's some British rarities here including the Sinclair QL and the Sam Coupe. No Dragon 32 yet sadly, but the beauty of this as an open project, which doesn't have the commercial drive for profit like the FPGA based console systems, is that we have a melting pot of both popular and rare or unusual system. So there's every possibility of a Dragon 32 appearing, or you could go ahead and code it yourself. As with the consoles, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you that the 8-bit machines are handled superbly. The Amstrad CPC here offering CPC 6128 and 664 modes, as well as a Multiface 2 option. The Multiface being an external peripheral you could buy to dump memory out of the system, poke data into memory and all manner of fun things. Support for peripherals then is a really nice touch. At the other end of the complexity scale, there's the 486 PC core, which is an interesting one and perhaps the most complex core here, as it uses about 90,000 of the 110,000 available logic elements. It's an admirable effort and impressive that Doom does indeed run, and its frame rate will give you an idea of the power on offer. While Doom may not be the most pleasant experience, this is more than capable of lower end 486SX gaming, and of course the full 386 library and earlier. Windows 95 certainly ran a lot better here than I've ever seen it on DOSBox in the Pi, even if I couldn't find a better video card driver for the emulated card. It was still fun to see Windows running on here, and running at what looks and feels like a completely accurate speed for a 486SX. Oh, and this video may have been delayed because I then lost several hours of my life to civilization. 
Sound Blaster 2 support is present with OPL 2 and 3 options, and you can also attach an external MIDI device. Or you could also run Soft MPU to emulate a Roland MT32 MIDI device on the Mister and enjoy all of those LucasArts and Sierra games as they were meant to be heard. I've included a link in the description of that particular setup being demonstrated on YouTube. A good 486 PC setup is not something I was expecting to find on the Mister, so it's a really nice addition which just really feels authentic and saying something feels right is very unscientific of course. The feeling of using an FPGA is a very hard thing to pin down and it's something we'll reflect on after more testing. On now to the Acorn Archimedes which along with the BBC Micro was a computer we found in British schools across the land in the 80s and 90s. The interesting thing about this machine is that it had an ARM CPU in it. ARM was developed by the engineers at Acorn and this core recreates the Archimedes A3000 model with 4 megabytes of RAM and an ARM 2A CPU. According to the documentation, this core is in beta status and runs at about 91% of the speed when using VGA video modes, but it's impressive nonetheless. While I may have failed to bypass Elite's copy protection system, I did have fun slaying orcs in Heroes Quest without any issues. This is a really fun chord for me to go back to and enjoy the titles that we were never allowed to run in the classroom. The irony is not lost on me that we're recreating an ARM CPU in FPGA, which itself has a dual-core ARM CPU connected to it by a high-speed bridge. There's nothing wrong with reinventing the wheel when we want our wheel to act like a 30-year-old wheel, and not like a modern wheel. The Amiga, of course the Amiga, I wasn't going to skip this one. The core is the Mr. variant of the Mini MiG or Mini Amiga, an open source recreation of the Amiga on FPGA dating back as far as 2005, so as you can imagine, it's a mature and well-developed core. My hard disk file boots to Tiny Launcher for convenience with a joystick, but we'll drop out of that back to the Amiga Workbench where you can see it's running Workbench 3.1 with lots of chip and fast RAM and an O20 CPU is detected. The AGA, OCS and ECS chipsets are supported making this a really nice all-round Amiga with a respectable O20 processor. It quite happily runs from an A500 up to an A1200 or CD32 with ease. On the screen is an OCS example here, that's state-of-the-art by Spaceballs running without any issue whatsoever. And as an AGA example, here's Alfred Chicken, that's the AGA version of the game running. Options include built-in stereo mixing to reduce the amount of stereo separation on the audio channels, which is synonymous with the Amiga. And if you're using floppy disk images, then the core includes a turbo mode for rapid floppy reading. This is easily better than running an Amiga emulator on a Pi. The ability to run those custom chips in parallel on the FPGA really does come into its own here, giving a nice responsive feel to everything. It runs at a nice speed overall, and the only compatibility issues I found were authentic to the original Amiga. Games falling over, for example, because they wanted the Kickstart 1.3 ROM, and that's easily resolved by changing it in the core menu. And of course, the obligatory Amiga Frontier demo here. I'm really quite tempted to put this in my new Checkmate 1500 case when it arrives, you know. It, it could be a nice modern alternative to putting an Amiga in there. Back to the core menu now and hidden away under the name FXCast, living in perfect harmony with our Amiga, it's an Atari ST core and what a gem this is. Released in 2018, this features cycle accurate 68000 CPU and chipset emulation of the Atari 520 ST or STFM. This is all about accuracy, there are no bells and whistles to speed up floppy reading or to give the CPU a boost, at least none that I could see in the on-screen core menus. That's all secondary to the goal of accuracy. And it does it really well, handling perfectly everything I tested it with. 
albeit with the slow original floppy disk loading times. A little speed boost would be welcome on that front and my understanding is that while the author of the core has released the source for the 68000 CPU, which is really useful for other cores to develop, he hasn't yet released the whole core and perhaps if he does we will then see some more rapid development on it by the community. Nevertheless, I think between the Amiga and the Atari ST, these are the two cores I'm most impressed with. They just... I don't know how to explain it. They just feel right. The way the mouse moves in gem and on workbench, the way the music plays, just everything about it, the mister really shines on the Amiga and the Atari ST. So I think you get the picture. I lost days playing with this setup. The Commodore 64 with dual SID option worked great. We could even mix SID chip variants on each channel on the fly. And I got to experience my first game of Manic Miner on the elusive Sam Coupe, and it was everything I had hoped it would be. A slightly sluggish Prince of Persia on the Sam Coupe was quickly transformed by knocking the CPU speed up. And Trevor and I played the worst game of darts ever witnessed on a BBC Micro, which seemed to set a car alarm off when he won. I even had a go at flicking some switches on an Altair 8800. Flash, flash, is it meant to do that? Wait for it. Double flash, brilliant. Screenshots may vary, as they say, and the experience you get on each core will vary massively according to how mature the core is. But this is far from a new technology. It's not a new community, it's not a new technology. The only thing that's changed in recent years is the fact that it's become affordable, in part thanks to the subsidising by Intel of boards like the D10 Nano to encourage developers and the development of FPGA systems. It has nothing to do with games, but as we always do so well, uh, the community has adopted the system for the sole purpose of games playing and emulation of old computers. And what an amazing job they've done with this Mr. Board and with this setup. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And it brings to me the same kind of excitement that I had when I first started discovering MAME, uh, playing all of those old games. At the time, some of those games were still in my local arcade, which is a, a completely different story now. But um, yeah, there's an excitement. There's a buzz about it. It just feels great. And I've used that word a few times, how it feels to use it, particularly with the Amiga and the Atari. There's a feeling that's really hard to describe without sitting you down in front of it and making you use it. And I think vital to the success of FPGA and the future of emulation and the preservation of the logic of systems is quantifying how accurate the emulation is. I mean, why would you spend £170 on this setup when you can spend less than £50 on a Pi and play Sonic the Hedgehog for example, and to you it feels the same. I personally think the promise of a totally accurate lag-free experience is a tempting one if it can be quantified, and I'm told the tools to measure and confirm the accuracy of these cores are now in development in the community and that will be a huge stride. Imagine being able to download a core with a 100% accuracy seal of approval that's been tried and tested and verified, and you know that you are truly getting the real experience on that system. Uh, all for a sub £200 price tag, that's when I think it really comes into its own. So in short, yes, you guessed it, I'm extremely excited about this. I think it's a huge part of the future of emulation and preservation. And, um, well, it won't quickly replace software emulators with dynamic recompilation and GPUs supporting them, but there's no reason why it can't in time as it scales up, as more logic elements become available, and as, hopefully, the community and the support for this technology grows, there's no reason why this can't become the de facto standard for emulation and for giving us the best possible emulation experiences. But don't wait for it to happen. Get on board with this now. It's a great system. Everything you need to know is in the description below, so go and check out those links. And until next time, I hope you enjoyed the video. Take a moment to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, give it an Australian thumbs up, and any questions you have, I'll see you in the comments section. Until next time, take care.
If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.